uh, let me note that we, this is a, a joint event with the B20, and I can't express uh, my gratitude enough to the Australian government and the B20 process. The, they've been a delight to work with, and so it's just a real honor for us to be able to co-host and participate with all those um, from the B20 process. So thank you for everyone who's involved in that. We're going to have a, uh, a dis discussion, which seems to be a format which is working for us over the last 48 hours. Uh, and we'll start with uh, Richard uh, Goiter, who is the head of the B20 and is the managing director and CEO at West Farmers. Uh, is, and he's going to be in conversation with Matthias Corman, who is, of course, the Minister of Finance. Gentlemen, it's all yours. Thank you. Thank you. Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, thanks for allowing uh, the Senator and I to spend a bit of time with you. Uh, as mentioned, I'm, uh, my name is Richard Goiter. I'm CEO of a company in Australia called West Farmers. We're, an in, we're a conglomerate with uh, retailing and industrial businesses and market capitalisation of around $50 billion and over 200,000 employees. And as it happens, we turn 100 this year. We were, we were founded as a farmers cooperative in Western Australia 100 years ago. Uh, I, as mentioned, I'm heading up the B20 in Australia, which is a group uh, that, that follows the G20, if you like, uh, and, and the Australian government's appointed 32 senior Australian business people to work uh, to look at formulating policies, recommendations on policies that the governments can consider in terms of the G20 uh, meeting later this year in Brisbane in November. Uh, we've got four task forces operating, one on trade, one on infrastructure, one on financing for growth, one on people headed by uh, Andrew McKenzie, the CEO of BHP Billiton on trade, David Thody, the CEO of Telstra on infrastructure, Mike Smith, the CEO of ANZ Bank on financing for growth, and Steve Sargent, the CEO of GE in Australia on human capital. Uh, and, and we will have a B20 summit in Sydney in July this year, after which we will put our recommendations to the government. Uh, but today it's my great pleasure to introduce um, Senator the Honourable Matthias Cormann, who's a senator from my home state of Western Australia, although when you hear Matthias talking you realise he's not a native Western Australian. In fact, he first came to Western Australia, I think, in 1994, loved the place, and it's uh, to our great benefit that he's decided to uh, move to Australia, uh, live in Western Australia, and he was sworn in as Finance Minister late last year, in September last year, and in that role um, the Minister will have an incredibly important part and, and role in setting the agenda and, and realising the economic agenda for this of the Australian Government. And as part of that, uh, also working very closely with the Treasurer, Joe Hockey, in terms of uh, Australia's uh, approach to the G20. So please join me in welcoming the Minister, the S Senator the Honourable Matthias Cormann. So, Matthias, I wonder if we can start off with a general question uh, in terms of uh, how you're seeing things in Australia and how, the, how, how your views on, on policy um, in, in terms of this government's policy then fits into the, Australia's G20 agenda. Um, th thank you, Richard. And uh, firstly, uh, thank you very much uh, to the IIF for organising an outstanding uh, conference here over the last two days, and you obviously decided to uh, leave the best uh, for last. Uh, it's very much appreciated, and it's great to be here with uh, Richard, who leads uh, an amazing uh, Australian business success story uh, based in my home state of Western Australia, in West Farmers, which uh, started in 1914 as a farmers cooperative, and, and now, of course, is uh, one of the largest retail businesses in Australia, largest One, two, employer, two, two. Uh, and so on. Uh, look, uh, the situation that uh, we inherited in Australia in coming uh, to government uh, in September last year uh, was uh, an economy uh, growing below trend, rising unemployment, uh, consumer confidence uh, um, not, not that strong, uh, business investment which had plateaued a, a budget that was uh, one, two, in, in pretty bad two, shape. Two, so one, two, the situation. Two. We're, we're very much focused as a government now on uh, doing everything we can to turn that situation around by pursuing uh, stronger growth, uh, policies that facilitate job creation, uh, and essentially with a very strong focus on improving our competitiveness, improving uh, productivity, uh, and uh, delivering policies that, that will help 
uh, to uh, take um, our economic growth potential back above, uh, above what, where, we're, where we're right now. Uh, so how does that fit in with um, the uh, agenda that we uh, are taking to the G20? Well, as the Treasurer indicated yesterday, our most important objective with the G20 is to uh, try and achieve consensus around a, a hard uh, target uh, for economic growth that is above uh, the business as usual uh, economic growth um, number. Uh, and uh, that will be the objective that we'll be pursuing uh, this weekend and hope, hopefully we'll be able to reach uh, agreement on a number. So h how are you feeling about the tension between fiscal discipline, and we heard a bit of this from Secretary Liu in the last session, and promoting growth, and, and, and what do you see as the government's role and the role of the private sector? Well, I mean, when we talk about fiscal consolidation, there are, of course, two parts of that story. I mean, one part of that story uh, is that there is a growth uh, dividend for government. Like, if you uh, achieve stronger economic growth, it does uh, drive uh, stronger revenue for government, which, of course, helps uh, with uh, the challenge of fiscal consolidation. There is no doubt that in Australia we, uh, we will have to do both. We will have to look uh, very closely at the expenditure side. We took... Uh, a, a large package of savings measures to the last election. We're building on that now uh, through the work uh, that a Commission of Audit uh, did here in Australia, as, as, as you would be aware. Uh, obviously, in the lead-up to the next uh, budget, we are uh, working very carefully to balance uh, both sides of the fiscal consolidation uh, equation. But, I mean, there's no doubt, uh, you know, scrapping the carbon tax will deliver a growth dividend, uh, reducing the regulatory uh, cost burden on business will deliver a, a growth dividend. Uh, providing a greater regulatory certainty will deliver a growth dividend. And of course, the work that we're uh, doing in terms of investing in productivity, enhancing uh, infrastructure, and trying to uh, leverage better uh, private sector investment in um, productivity enhancing infrastructure, all of those things taken together, uh, we, we are very uh, confident will deliver a growth uh, dividend, which uh, will obviously help with the fiscal consolidation task. Well, one of the things that uh, the, the B20, and, and, and by the way, the B20, uh, I talked about 32 business representatives in Australia. We've got more than 200 business people from around the globe working on our four task forces, and we also have a CEO council, which is uh, over 100 people that we can reference our, our policy recommendations against. Uh, one of the things that the, the B20 is, is uh, strong on is that we're not just asking government for a set of policies, that the business actually, if we get policies in place, can uh, invest and can create jobs. And, and I think that's a, you know, it's, business I think is very much part of the solution in terms of higher economic growth. Well, clearly the priority ought to be for private sector-led uh, growth. And, and I mean, in an Australian context, we're very mindful uh, that the cost of doing business in Australia has been going up in, in recent years. Uh, our international competitiveness has been going down, and we've got to reverse uh, that trend. Australia is a trading nation, so obviously a stronger global growth uh, will be good for us, as it, as it will be good for other parts of the world. But we very much uh, have to make sure uh, that internally we are as competitive as we can be, that we get back to that global competitive edge uh, in, in terms of uh, uh, you know, really maximising our potential. All right. Now we're at an IIF conference and uh, we again just heard Secretary Liu touch on this, but uh, I'd be interested in your perspective on, on the issue of, of finance regulation and the concept of risk and, and, uh, and financial flows and how, how that balance, the appropriate balance gets achieved. Well, it's always important uh, to, to get the balance right. I mean, if you make things too stable, obviously that has uh, you know, an impact on your capacity uh, to grow your economy more strongly. By the same token, if you uh, don't uh, ensure that there is appropriate uh, stability, then that in itself uh, has got all sorts of uh, negative flow and consequences, as we've seen in, in recent years. Look, there's been a lot of reform uh, internationally in this space. In Australia, what uh, we have initiated as a government uh, is a financial systems inquiry uh, chaired by David Murray, the former uh, CEO of the Commonwealth uh, Bank of Australia here, uh, here in Australia. Uh, that's going to be a very uh, important uh, review which uh, will provide advice to the government on how uh, essentially get exactly that balance as right as possible. I don't think it's a perfect science, but it is a matter of making sure uh, that uh, you allow those flows uh, to, to happen <laughs> 
as uh, efficiently as possible uh, while not exposing the economy to uh, you know, inappropriate levels of risk. And I mean, I think it's going to be, I, I think, uh, I don't think you'll ever end up uh, in a final position when it comes to the reform uh, effort, but by the same token, after you have made significant changes, you probably need to let things settle a bit to really get a good, good sense of uh, where things are heading. Yeah, I, I think that we would be in strong agreement on that. Uh, can I turn to trade, which is, you just mentioned Australia is a trading nation, uh, and Minister Robb's been active already. Uh, can you talk the, through the government's policy on trade and, and again, where you see the, the G20 heading on, on trade? Well, I mean, we are very committed to uh, achieve, um, you know, free trade agreements uh, wherever uh, it helps us grow a stronger economy uh, here in Australia. But Minister Rob uh, has been successful, uh, you know, in, in finalising a free trade agreement uh, with South Korea, which is now going through the uh, formal uh, processes to be brought to a conclusion. We're uh, very hopeful that we will be able to reach an agreement with uh, Japan soon and of course uh, we've got a very ambitious uh, timetable uh, in terms of uh, reaching agreement with China um, which, which um, uh, Andrew Robb is doing a lot of work uh, on and then we've got of course the TPP process uh, which uh, is looking very promising. Mm. Yeah. Uh, can I, I'll turn to infrastructure now and uh, uh, some work that's been done by the McKinsey Global Institute which says that there's something like a $57 trillion gap in infrastructure between the needs and, and what's occurred across the globe. Uh, the Prime Minister, Tony Abbott, has said that he will be the infrastructure Prime Minister in Australia. And, and infrastructure is going to be a key topic today uh, and over the weekend for the Treasurer and um, through the G20. What's your perspective on, on what Australia can be doing and then what the, the, the world, um, what other countries can be doing to bridge this gap of infrastructure investment? Well, we've obviously got to come up with uh, you know, creative ways to uh, channel uh, more investment into quality uh, infrastructure investments. Now, I mean, in Australia, in the lead-up uh, to the last election, we did make uh, a whole series of commitments uh, in, in relation to accelerated uh, and increased uh, infrastructure investment, which we are currently uh, rolling out, with the, the particular focus being on productivity, enhancing high-quality uh, infrastructure investments. But uh, beyond that, um, what we think from a, from a government point of view, at a federal and state and territory level for that matter, there are a whole range of assets currently held in government uh, hands that probably don't need to be owned by government any longer. There's a lot of capacity here and the figure that um, has been put on it, there's a potential $130 billion worth of assets uh, which could be uh, recycled with the proceeds uh, reinvested uh, in uh, productivity enhancing infrastructure of the future. And, and of course that then gives you quite a good platform uh, to uh, leverage private sector investment, make appropriate uh, vehicles uh, for uh, private sector investment to augment that uh, investment uh, uh, available as well. Um, I mean, that is going to be very much, what, what can happen internationally is going to be very much part of the conversation at the G20 this weekend. I know there's going to be uh, an infrastructure round table this afternoon, uh, which uh, is chaired by Joe Hockey. Uh, I'm sure that there's going to be a lot of additional ideas that, that come out of that. But the key is going to be really uh, to come up with new and creative ways to um, channel uh, the capital that is out there uh, into high quality assets, which will help strengthen economic growth moving forward. Well, uh, um, uh, certainly there's, there's a view on infrastructure that it's actually not the, not the lack of money, that there's money, as you said, there's capital to, to go. It's, it's, it's how we achieve the, the flow of capital into these investments. Uh, and transparency and anti-corruption and, and, and a bunch of other rules and regulations. Regulatory certainty. Yeah, are going to be important. Regulatory certainty is very important, I think. Anything else on that front that you think we're going to have to sort of look at? Because, again, I think there's something like 3% um, of, of, of growth available to, of, yeah. to the globe if we can get this. Well, I, I thought there were some interesting conversations earlier today. I mean, I, you know, obviously once uh, an infrastructure asset is established and there is a reliable cash flow that flows from it. It's much easier for uh, private investors to make informed judgments. And, and maybe the role for government uh, is in the early stages to uh, help de-risk uh, 
uh, you know, significant uh, productivity enhancing uh, infrastructure investments and, and you know, progressively uh, as they establish their credentials, uh, continuously recycle that capital and look for other opportunities to uh, essentially come up with more projects that can take it to the next level. Um, I mean, what's probably happened too much, um, I mean, I, I think that in Australia there's much scope to recycle uh, some of the investments of the past to yeah. really deploy that capital more productively uh, for that sort of investment of the future. Yeah, okay. Uh, and the, and the, the, the B20 topic we haven't talked about is human capital. Uh, and uh, I think everyone acknowledges unemployment in parts of the world are too high, and even within Australia, which has a relatively low unemployment, youth unemployment is still too high. Well, any, any thoughts on what business and government can do specifically to, to, to deal with the issues of unemployment, not just in Australia, but um, more globally? Well, uh, pr probably work together more closely on uh, making sure that education and training is uh, relevant to what comes after uh, you leave uh, your, your schooling or your training environment. Uh, I, I think, I mean, the, the Howard government did a lot of very good work on that, and it's an area that we want to pick up on again here in Australia now, but really making sure that the training and the education um, that happens is actually relevant to, to what comes in the workplace after. Right. Now, two other areas that actually aren't on the B20 agenda, but uh, uh, certainly people are advocating should be on the G20 agenda. Uh, um, currency and tax. Any comments on, on, on those two issues? <laughs> well, I, I was asked earlier whether, you know, what, what my thoughts were on the Australian dollar and I said the value of the Australian dollar is set by the market mm. and I would, I, would, I would say the same to you. I mean, obviously the floating of the Australian dollar was an, an important economic reform for Australia. We are an open economy, we are a trading economy. Um, there's no doubt that the strength of the dollar in uh, recent years has had implications for our competitiveness, um, which uh, is forcing uh, us into some structural adjustments that are painful in parts, but which will probably have to necessarily be uh, worked uh, through. Now, uh, when it comes, so what was the other one? Uh, the other one was on tax. On tax, yeah. So taxes should be uh, as low as possible. <laughs> <laughs> Look, uh, <laughs> um, I mean, I, I think in terms of the G20, obviously the important, the important part of the G20 agenda when it comes to tax is to ensure that um, uh, businesses operating across the globe uh, pay their fair share of tax uh, in, in those uh, countries where they generate their income, where they generate their profits. And I mean, I think that there is a lot of... Uh, work to be done in that space. It's very hard for individual countries to take action uh, in, in that area unilaterally because, of course, uh, it, it does have uh, potential flaw and implications in terms of uh, one country's competitiveness in a, in a global environment. So it's very important for the G20 to find a way to uh, deal with that, that particular issue. But I mean, beyond that, um, the Australian government's view is uh, that reducing the tax burden is a very important part of our agenda for stronger growth. Great. Um, I, I, there's a very full agenda today, so uh, I think we might wrap up there unless anyone in the audience has got a question they have a burning des desire to ask the Minister. If, if not, on your behalf, uh, Matthias, can I thank you very, very much for joining us today for your very succinct answers to the questions and can I wish you luck in your formidable, formidable task of um, keeping the government's finances under control in the coming years. Thank, thank you, you very much.